On this edition of the Open Alliance Show, 1787, the Flying Circuits are here. Talk about their current progress. They have one of the coolest intakes I have seen so far, the snake intake, as they call it. Uh, you got to just check out all the different motion they're doing with the notes this year and how that geometry is working out for them is really, really cool. So much more to talk about. We'll be diving into uh, their programming as well, too, what they've been doing from uh, their vision systems, from their object detection. Uh, and we're also going to be covering more in regards to their different CAD, uh, what they've been doing. They have both a 2D sketch um, and also full 3D style modeling we'll be diving into. But look at this awesome intake right here. And watch this, how the uh, ring goes straight through this, the uh, note that it has. This is so cool. Let's dive more into flying circuits here on the Open Alliance Show. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted at Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Coming up next on the Open Alliance show is going to be 1787. The Flying Circus this is a team uh, I definitely remember uh, a couple of years ago. I, I saw you all at the Finger Lakes Regional. You got an absolutely phenomenal performance. And this team has really been on the up and up the last couple of years. So I can't wait to dive more into what Flying Circuits are doing uh, this year as well. Make sure you check out their OA blog on Chief Delphi. they got some cool sketches, and I know some more updates uh, for that as well, too. We're going to be covering uh, robot overview, going into your CAD subsystems. we got some props as well, too, and uh, talking about code as well. So we're excited to dive into it. Three fantastic students here and another one joining us later. So students, if you don't mind, can you introduce yourselves and let us know what you do on the team? Sure. Hi, my name is Charlie, and I'm 1787's president and head driver. Hi, I'm Gemma, and I'm the most important um, job, or have the most important job, as you might think. I'm the food captain. I'm also the one of the engineer leads, so. Uh, I'm Jack. I'm also an engineering lead. I don't know if I've heard and, uh, of food Jack captain before, by the way. That's a, that's a first <laughs> for me. Uh, on this as well. And I know we have Ben coming in a little bit later uh, as well, too. So um, why don't we uh, dive right in? You get a lot to cover uh, that your team's been working on. So give us some updates on where you're at and where your build progress is going. Of course. So first, we wanted to talk about our priorities, like our design philosophy coming out of uh, Reveal Day. So we decided pretty right away that we wanted to be a speaker shot robot. So a robot that shoots high into the speaker. Um, we wanted to really prioritize that in terms of our launcher. Um, but then again, we were able to recognize that we don't know what other teams are going to prioritize. Um, maybe most teams are going to be speaker shooting robots. And uh, you obviously get random partners in qualifiers. So if um, our random partners happen to not also prioritize the amp shot, um, then we didn't want to be kind of uh, floating in the water without a way to amplify. Um, so we wanted to be kind of a hybrid, which is a speaker shooting robot um, that can also score in the amp. Um, so that's been our de design philosophy in terms of scoring. Um, also, we have an under the bumper intake that I affectionately call our Roomba intake, since we can kind of just roll over notes and take them in. Um, climbing in the end game, our team has in the past with end games that involve climbing, prioritized that. So that's definitely something we want to be able to do. And then the trap. So day one, right after the reveal, we decided that the trap was not something we were going to gun for. Um, it definitely wasn't a priority that we were going to make sure that we did. Um, but then again, every time that we have sort of made something new in our design, we have always kept the trap in mind. So we keep saying, oh, this prototype is cool, but also like, how can it work with the trap? Um, so you'll kind of see that everything we do is kind of trap influenced. So even though the trap isn't a priority, it's definitely influenced uh, more than anything else. Um, so we just wanted to go over some AutoCAD for our entire robot. Um, so first, here's our frame. It's just a basic chassis. We have four swerve Kraken driven motors this year with Neo steering. So we're going to hope to be a lot faster than we have been in the past. Um, then, as you can see, uh, we are going to, as we talk about later, have a sort of snake like intake. So we intake from under the robot and then we bring it up in this S pattern, um, which Gemma will talk about. Um, then here are the wheels on the intake that's going to be doing that. We have some uh, standard fly wheels. We also have some passive rollers as well as some passive rollers, uh, polycarbonate wrapped in silicon, which will be exciting. Um, here is our frame for that. And then we also have our system of belts and pulleys. Um, now for the star of the show, we have our accelerator. So our accelerator has a sort of Rembrandt's inspired uh, head plate that we're gonna be talking about in a bit. And this whole subsystem here um, will rotate. So the reason specifically that we have this sort of um, S shape 
is that so when we're stowed down up until our speaker shot um, in any of these kind of range of motions, we're going to be able to um, feed a note from the bottom of the floor to our to our launcher. So the idea is uh, we'll be in stowed orientation while we're just driving around the field. And then for our speaker shot, we're going to be able to raise the arm up to here. And then for the amp shot and the trap trap shot, we're going to be able to rotate our arm this way and then move the whole thing uh, right up to the to the uh, goalpost here on the app. So uh, we do have some prototype models that will demonstrate that much more clearly later. Um, but those were kind of our design philosophies. So now so we can real talk quick, about... I, I want to ask you guys, if you don't mind on this, is that um, I noticed that I believe you're using AutoCAD for those sketches, right? Um, but your team is using Onshape for other 3D solid modeling. Uh, what made you want to like stick with AutoCAD for still doing sketches uh, versus like maybe moving all that into Onshape? So we really like Onshape. Um, it certainly streamlines a lot of the design process for our robots. But when it comes to just designing something in 2D to just laser cut really quick and just rapidly prototype, um, a lot of members of our team are still very comfortable with AutoCAD and still prefer it. So we're kind of more of an in-between phase currently instead of just fully adopting Onshape at this point. Um, but when it comes to our main robot assembly and everything in 3D, um, that is in Onshape. No, that totally makes sense on that. I was real, just really curious. And uh, by the way, your intake uh, looks awesome. So let's dive more into that oh. and uh, talking about that concept. Like, this is so cool. Yeah, 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 bring yeah, bring yeah we actually yeah. have it up on the table. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so Here's we have a prop. Right. Oh, right, wow. So Gemma's going to take it away and tell us about sort of the decisions we made and how we arrived at this point. We have our original prototype that was inspired by some other teams. Jack knows all the numbers. I forget. And so... It moves in sort of an S shape, as shown by the AutoCAD that Charlie has, or that Charlie showed us. And then we have a video of, it, of this prototype um, running, and that we can do it quite fast, which is really nice to see. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, yeah, okay. And so um, the actual polycarbonate final, hopefully, hopefully final in intake is going to have neos on it instead of the um sim motors and so it's about 50 percent faster calculated with our gear gearing and all that kind of stuff and so this is um our 3d model that i've gotten to make and it's really fun and so as you let me go here so this is kind of this is the back of the robot and then it comes under up and actually no it comes like this it comes under <laughs> and sort of in this boomerang to um, create sort of to the handoff, which Jack is going to talk about in a second. But we got some passive polycarbonate rollers. And then some of these are, have, are supposed to have silicone on them, but we haven't modeled that yet because it's a little bit of a work in progress. And uh, yeah, I'm going to toss it over to Jack. Yeah. And uh, one thing we would like to mention, too, is that we debated a long time over that over the bumper, <coughs> under the bumper intake. Um, but we decided that this is our best option because over the bumper intakes get beat up. I personally have had to take off, you know, two polycarbonate arms and 20, you know, one inch spacers many, many times in the pit because we got a beat up intake. Um, so we have uh, sort of funnels under our chassis so that the note can still have a wide berth like an over the bumper intake while not getting beat up. All right. Yeah. So uh, I guess I'll start talking about our uh, accelerator, as we've been calling it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just gonna move to the AutoCAD model. Mm -hmm. Just, yeah. So one thing about the AutoCAD, like about the design for a robot is while, um, while a lot of the movements from the bottom of the intake into the uh, accelerator happens from this subsystem here, there is still a segment on the accelerator that actually helps move it in. We're gonna have two or three powered wheels that help move it in. That one of them is gonna be um, a roller that's around our actual axle that we use for pivoting, and then one or two above the nodes so we can actually position it where we want before we launch it into the flywheels. Um, the reason that we're doing that specifically is so we can actually remove our entire uh, accelerator assembly if we need to and replace it really fast during a, during a competition. Um, when it comes to actually coming up with a design for this, uh, we had three main like ideas originally for uh, prototyping. And they were kind of fueled by the uh, main goal of we really wanted to be able to shoot from the midpoint of the field into the speaker. Um, that was just something that we thought would be really cool. It'd be a good goal to aim for. 
so that led us that led, led us to having uh, three different ideas for a, a launcher. One of them was one was with uh, wheels on the sides of the notes, um, which was really good at giving spin to the notes. But we realized that it wasn't very um, accurate once we actually launched it. So then we also tried a robot that had kind of like an arc shot where the note would spin up around one wheel and shoot out the other side. And um, that was had a lot of the same issues, but it also had not very good compression on the note at all. Um, so eventually we actually saw what uh, Team 95, the uh, grasshoppers, had for their shooter um, with the axle all the way across on both ends, kind of on an angle. And we kind of wanted to put our own spin on that. So that led us to um, <laughs> that led us to a design that had actually the actual splits. So we can have them all at the same position. And then we can just have one side spin faster than the other side. Um, and that can actually uh, sort of pull up a video yeah. here for you. So this is um, our first shot with the uh, prototype. We actually got it first try, which was yeah. really cool. Uh, I wasn't expecting yeah. that. We, uh, we missed all the other shots for a while until we dialed it in a bit better. Uh, but after it was dialed in, from 20 feet away, we were able to get around four out of every five shots in with our prototype, which is, I think, is pretty good at least. Um, and then, then we also wanted to score on the amp for our ro robot as well, or and the trap maybe. Yeah. Um, so we have a little hood that um, is power, going to be powered by surgical tubing. So when our arm rotates back, it can slam into the amp and this hood will come over the top of the accelerator. And once we run it, it'll redirect the note instead of flying out straight, it will redirect it back and then we can slam dunk it into the, uh, into the amp. This looks really, was, really cool so far. And something I, I want to ask you guys is that, you know, there's a lot of movement with these notes. And they seem like they've been moving really, really well, right? Through your robot, like it, it's very fluid and very fluent. But through your testing, have you noticed any degradation amongst the notes uh, by having so many different contact points and movement? Is that anything, a potential concern for your team? Yeah, actually, yeah. One one thing that I did want to mention is uh, Jack mentioned that we had sort of a uh, a prototype launcher where you rotate the note around a curve and launch it out. And uh, one of the reasons we decided that that didn't work is uh, we couldn't translate the energy from horizontal compression into the launcher. It kind of reached a peak and never went further, no matter how revved up the, uh, the motors were. Um, but one other thing is that uh, all of our horizontal compression designs just tore up the notes. Um, we definitely saw our original note um, yeah. is yeah. really beat up. We can, we can get it here. This is the, the one we brought home on build day. <laughs> nice. This is a see. more yeah. fresh but, note. Um, our current intake, because it uses all those passive rollers and because the silicone is really, really grippy with the notes, it actually really doesn't beat them up that much. So some of our newer notes are still in very good condition. Um, now I'm great that that you all have uh, tested that out and uh, and seen those results out, especially with how uh, limited notes have been in availability right now. I know that's a big yeah, concern sure. amongst many teams, and they'll be coming out soon, but still something to keep in mind for that. So really cool. So this is all fantastic so far. I can't wait to hear more. Yeah, and before we move on, I just wanted to say that um, in the past, we've definitely been influenced by Open Alliance for our design philosophy. We've taken a lot of inspiration from what some other teams are doing. And this year, we're really excited because it's our first year doing Open Alliance, and Jack is actually running our Open Alliance. Um, so I just want to say that he's doing a great job. If you're interested in sort of any of our design philosophies or anything going on, um, you can definitely tune in there on Chief Delphi. And Jack, if you wanted to talk about some of the design philosophies we have for that launcher this year. You can also throw that in as well from Open Alliance. Like the oh, yeah, yeah. So um, as I said, um, a big part of our uh, launcher design was inspired from Team 95, the Grasshoppers. Um, we saw what they had done, and we were we thought that was really cool, and we want to see if we could do it ourselves, um, maybe even a little bit better. Um, we don't actually know if we've done it better yet because we haven't <laughs> built it yet. Um, but that was one of the big inspirations for it. Um, Team 3847 Spectrum Robotics has also been very helpful just in general. Um, we've gotten a lot of inspiration from just many different things from our robots over the years from them. Absolutely. Um, team 4418 Rembrandt's, um, they're also very helpful. Um, we got the our actual like amp slam dunk design, while very different from their design, uh, it's heavily inspired from theirs. That's where we originally got the idea to redirect the notes like that. And one of those key differences is that we have a passive system that's attached to the end of our shooter. So nothing is actually powered in this uh, in this video besides our launcher that we use for the speaker shot. Um, so that's kind of nice is that we don't have to worry about all those passive rollers. 
um, during our speaker shot, they're moved out of the way. And then when we back into the amp, they're where they need to be to redirect that shot. Um, so now we can introduce another core member of our team um, to talk about some coding. We've been doing some really exciting programming stuff. So here's our lead programmer and vice president. Hi. Uh, so my name's Ben. Um, as Charlie said, I'm the lead programmer on the team. And I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the programming stuff that we've done going into this build season, um, going over the summer and, and towards the beginning of the school year. So uh, just a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, first, we'll be talking about some uh, custom April tag detection uh, that we try to implement towards the beginning of the school year. Then we'll be talking about some of the vision harbor that we've implemented. And then finally, some of the code philosophy that we wanted to adopt going into this build season. So first, this is probably our most impressive thing that we've done um, code-wise. Uh, it's a from scratch April, April tag detection algorithm. Uh, basically, the principle behind this was that um, we knew that uh, the pre-implemented implementations of, of April tag detection already worked, right? Like the limelight ones, the, the um, photon vision, and also uh, even OpenCV's own um, RU code tag detections, those already work, but we wanted to um, dive deeper and make our own algorithm, even if uh, we didn't end up implementing this on our final robot, we thought it was gonna be a great way to learn how these algorithms actually worked. I think a majority of teams, um, they use the limelight algorithm, but they don't actually know how it works. So- um, And a great fallback option in case uh, we don't have access to the- Exactly, photon version. exactly, exactly. Um, so the goal with this uh, algorithm was that eventually we'll get this ported onto our robot and we'll actually be using it in competition. So um, just a brief overview of how this algorithm actually works. Um, it's this sort of four-step process. We start with edge detection, where we find points in this grayscale image. Um, the grayscale image isn't shown. We find where, where the, um, the image goes very quickly from bright to dark, and those represent points where there's likely to be an edge. From there, we can find connected components, which is this top view up here, this black image. Um, connected components show us points where there's a edge that looks sort of like a square, right? Um, so these square shaped edges are what we use for the next step. But you can see um, this step isn't perfect. We still need to tune it a little bit. Um, you can see a few artifacts. Really, we shouldn't be seeing this green or this light blue or this purple. But um, this is after the process of a decent amount of tuning already. From there, we apply something called a Huff transform, where we go into each component and we find basically the most common straight lines that each pixel falls onto. So um, I'm going to only explain this very like uh, high level. It, it won't be very uh, like in detail. If you guys want to uh, want to know more about the Huff transform or any anything in this, um, the April tag papers are public and those are a great resource. Also, um, just Googling Huff transform and these, this perspective endpoint, which I'll get to next, um, they're great ways to learn about this. But basically, the Huff transform will allow us to go from these components to these straight lines. And using these straight lines, we can find these really nice, uh, nice clean intersection points that tell us where the corner of the April tags are. Once we know the corners, we can finally do this last step called solving the perspective endpoint problem. Basically, the perspective endpoint problem is a common, uh, common issue in uh, computer science, where basically given endpoints on your screen, you want to determine what perspective you're looking at those endpoints from. In this case, we have four points, so it's a perspective four point uh, problem. So using these four points um, and using a lot of linear algebra based math, um, complex math that I can't explain right now, um, we can uh, apply basically a linear transformation that brings um, the coordinate tag frame, uh, the tag coordinate frame, sorry, into our own robot camera frame. Um, and we'll be basically be able to find the relative position of our camera relative to the April tag. So um, this algorithm is still a work in progress, but we're hoping to get it uh, working for our first regional, uh, which is a week one regional. And um, basically at this point, we've gotten each individual component of the, each part of this algorithm working, but the overall thing we are still have to put together. So. The last thing I want to ask you uh, from a code standpoint, uh, do you have a general thought processes on what you're looking to accomplish for autonomous? Uh, yeah, so for autonomous, we wanted to go for, so we knew we wanted to at least get that, um, a, get a three note auto. A big part of the auto this year is that we want to be able to start from anywhere on that field. Um, using Path Planner's new software where they've, they've come out with new stuff saying that um, uh, you can like customize paths that are independent from auto routines. We wanted to implement that 
just so that we can have as much flexibility as uh, we can with our robot. Sure. And speaking of flexibility, like one of our priorities with our launcher was to be able to launch from pretty far out on the field and be able to launch variably. So from anywhere from the subwoofer to that farthest point. Um, that way we don't have to rely on going right up to the subwoofer. That way we can just pick up a note and fire right away. Um, sort of like we were doing in Rapid React, um, almost like a shoot from anywhere type deal. Um, so we're hoping that'll make our auto very flexible if we can just pick up notes, move forward a couple feet and just launch it from, uh, from the stage. Mm -hmm. And another big thing is we don't want to constrain our auto too much right now. Um, we're looking to try and get our robot running first and then seeing what it can do. Um, and then from there, we'll develop auto strategies that play off of our robot strengths. Well, Flying Circuits, thank you uh, so much for taking time. There's so much to unpack uh, that you are doing that I think is really cool. So really looking forward to, uh, from your algorithm side, seeing the process and development of that. I'm glad that some of this is also available for others to uh, check out as well, too. And then from your mechanical and your, your superstructure side, I mean, this is going to be an awesome robot. So I really can't wait to see what develops out of this. So thank you so much. We can't wait to uh, check back in with you throughout the season. Make sure you check out uh, Flying Circuits' uh, build blog on Chief Delphi. And good luck the rest of the way, guys. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having Thanks us. Thanks you so Thank much you. for having us. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now. And check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.